Thank you very much. Welcome uh, to this second day. I am uh, Adnan Sheric from uh, UNIDO. I'm a project manager dealing with issues on uh, cluster policy. And um, I will uh, take just a few minutes, basically, to um, set the stage uh, for what is to follow and what my uh, colleagues or collaborators on uh, some of the projects uh, will then report on uh, uh, you need those interventions uh, in terms of cluster policy in, in, in two countries, in Vietnam and Montenegro. Um, let me just briefly start by um, setting the stage by actually providing a bigger picture on where and how we nest cluster policy within the larger industrial policy framework. And in order to do that, I think it is very important, and Menu has already mentioned that at the beginning, to take into consideration the the bigger picture of the current political economy development uh, around the globe. And this is basically, we are, what we are basically observing are the changing patterns of investment and trade flows. And this is more, most starkly highlighted by the emergence of global value chains. So we see an increase in foreign direct investments. They are going more away from the established developed markets towards developing economies. And they trigger obviously also a change in trade flows because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, foreign uh, or a lot of trade is in fact intra industry, intra firm trade, which leads us basically to a, a new global condition of competition in a way that firms are now more and more competing uh, for resources, markets, skills. The first two in particular apply to developing countries, the, the next frontier markets. And this obviously presents the developing countries with uh, policy challenges and uh, translated basically into a very plain language, the basic question that policymakers are asking themselves is how to access new markets or how to access markets in general, how to get technology on board, how to increase or upgrade the skills or the skill sets. Which is actually, this development has led to a, a renewal of interest in industrial policy. Uh, we, are, we are slowly moving away of, also on the donor side from the focus on social outcomes towards more productive activities, so basically using active industrial policy in order to uh, compensate for certain market failures and to enhance operations of certain markets. So when we speak about cluster policy in general, I think one needs to keep the contents in mind and nest it as one of the tools that a policy, toolmaker, uh, a policy maker has in his toolbox as opposed to consider it as the only tool for for uh, uh, industrial policy development. So that's very important. So let me just go briefly uh, back away from the political economy argument towards a purely e economic argument for having a cluster policy in the first place. And I assume many of you in this room are economists, so you probably, uh, you're, you're going back to your Econ 101 class probably. But um, the principal rationale, so at the very heart, what is at the very heart of cluster policy is basically uh, the presence of certain market failures and specific local ex externalities to use the economist lingo basically. So if we speak about externalities that affect uh, cluster formation, then typically we refer to information asymmetries and coordination failures. The first one, just uh, to remind you of it, so basically, to, or to give an example, so if a company uh, in, in a specific locality is investing into a technology uh, its peers, uh, suppliers, business development institutions, etc., may not be aware of it, and therefore they may not be in a position to provide the complementary goods that are needed or, or complementary investments. Therefore, we are having a suboptimal solution in, in, in a sense. And the, the, the second aspect would be a, a plain coordination failure where the different economic actors do not manage basically to coordinate the individual activities, which again presents a market failure. So, what are the, pos the possible policy answers? Well, traditionally, a policymaker could resort to, or would have basically two options uh, at his or her disposal. So the first one would be basically use of vertical policies. And this would mean actually very targeted approach. So you target individual firms and you commit resources, so you actually hitting the target, you're having a lot of leverage, but this comes at the expense of being potentially very distortive to the economy at large. 
The alternative there, again, would be a horizontal set of policies where you actually broaden the scope, you take many other stakeholders into consideration, but the question there is whether you still have that leverage. So they tend to basically uh, be much more shallow and less effective, so a lot of, include a lot of waste of resources. And this is where cluster policy kicks in, basically. Cluster policy as an alternative is a tool that provides very targeted or specific support, public policies, and is aimed at clusters. So basically, to give you an idea, if you take the example of works, workforce development programs, you are basically focusing on a specific region, and in collaboration with the different uh, market players, you are defining their needs and then propose targeted solutions that benefit a wider spectrum of beneficiaries. The same would hold for investment promotion, where you basically figure out what is the missing puzzle and then devise the policies that go in a targeted manner after investors who would come and, and uh, basically fill the gap that you have. The alternative option here would be then again, and this is not mutually exclusive by the way, but would be to look into creation of platforms of joint collaboration, so the, the cluster initiatives as we call them. Uh, and this is where UNIDO is doing uh, a lot of, um, or where, where UNIDO's efforts are, are focused at. And this is used as a means in the first place to avoid the externality and also to help policymakers understand what needs to be done in the first place in order to have an efficient communication among the uh, collaborators and also to define actually joint agenda so to uh, either upgrade the companies or the, the business environment or to strengthen uh, forward and backward linkages. So in that respect, cluster-based approaches to policy development seem to be a more efficient way of uh, targeting government support. And just to illustrate further, uh, this is an example from France, uh, a European or developed country basically that has been using cluster policy as, a main, as one of the main vehicles in delivering industrial policy. Um, they, they don't label it clusters, they, they use a French word uh, called the compétivité. Um, but in principle, this, they, they, they act according to the same principle. So what they do is they segment their policies according to the clusters that they have. So um, there's, a, there's a layer of, of clusters that can compete in principle at the global level, and there they use modes of competition to actually uh, attract or to provide support, targeted, very targeted support or to start or to further support cluster initiatives. At, at a very much global level, so very targeted measures that go directly at those very competitive clusters. Then the next layer would be the national or at the national level, where you have clusters that are um, fairly competitive but not yet there at the level that they compete globally. So they would need then again another set of measures that are very much space, uh, 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 targeted to that strata of um, uh, the cluster population. And then you have a specific set of policies that go then further down at the local regional level um, that look into uh, issues of uh, regional or local economic development and that are policies, again, aimed at fostering cluster development but take a broader spectrum of, of policy into consideration. So not necessarily aiming at reaching the national global level. So in sum, it's, it's basically a basket of policies that are on the one side sector specific and on the other side very targeted. So is there an optimal approach to cluster policy or could that serve as an optimal approach to cluster policy? I think that's very difficult to say. The most important, I mean, one of the lessons learned out, coming out of all these uh, case studies is basically that it is context specific in the first place. So it will very much depends on your, uh, depend on your country context. Um, the other, the other learning is actually that it's also a very dynamic process. So in principle, there are no static, or these are not static policies, but they, rather they evolve over time and they, they need to be tracked. And so the experience from, from the French, Europeans, or even the US, is basically that um, the approaches that they have taken on board are considered as, the appro as optimal approaches to develop further development of industrial policy. Now, just to link into that, and I would, link, I I would provide here a brief link to the um, literature on economic geography that has been basically studying clusters at large. As a policymaker, what you are aiming at basically, or the, the, 
that's actually my plan. <laughs> so I will take just another two, three minutes if you don't mind. Uh, if looking at the academic research, basically, what we have is a uh, clear indication that agglomeration and competitiveness go hand in hand. There is a strong correlation uh, between the two. So if you move to the, to the right on the, uh, on, on the horizontal axis, so the more agglomeration, agglomeration you have, um, and if you look at the uh, vertical axis, so the better competitiveness you have in terms of employment, outputs, etc., you would find countries like, or regions within countries like Germany or France in the uh, upper uh, right-hand corner. Um, now, if we translate that, or if we take a very intuitive approach to it, then you would actually say what makes sense is to go after, uh, or is to chase, or is, is to make an attempt to actually increase the agglomeration. And that's exactly the case that has been happening in many developing countries, at least that's what we've been observing, that the policymakers have been aiming at designing incentives that would purely look into getting the agglomeration into place. So uh, a lot of resources being put, a type of a big push towards attracting specific industries into specific localities. And um, clearly this is a suboptimal outcome because at the same time what this uh, schematic representation, uh, presentation shows us in a way that is it, you have to work also on the competitiveness issues at the same time. So not trying to attract completely new industries to completely new locations, but rather looking and examining what you have already and then working on it in order to increase the impediment. So the natural cluster concept is very important. I will, I will actually start, but um, I will just skip on that and maybe provide in two slides just or set the stage for what is to come. Um, I'm labeling then the opportunities for development of more effective policies. And these are insights, basically, not necessarily uh, empirically tested, or at least not by us, uh, but something that is a summary of, of some of the work or, or some of the lessons learned in, in, in our work on clusters across the world. And uh, this is just a menu of five policy recommendations, basically, that starts with the policy analysis. A lot of cluster policy in developing countries is still done out of a black box. You simply don't have reliable, neutral information that lets you actually um, determine what would be the optimal policy scenario and design. So investing into uh, cluster mapping, investing into cluster observatories, etc., gathering reliable information should be the key priority for the stakeholders to start with, or for policymakers to start with. The policy context, so there is really a need for better understanding of clusters. There is a better need to actually tailor the interventions to your own context. Are you, so are you looking into natural or are you, are you trying to engineer clusters? Are you looking into emerging or into mature clusters? So all these need uh, obviously specific policies. So the policy context is very important to understand. Policy design, obviously. So if we are speaking about clusters and platforms, you need to bring the stakeholders, all the stakeholders around the table and make sure that you improve that design of the coordination mechanisms. Policy coordination, obviously, cluster policy as a tool, as a platform, needs to be used also to link up to other private sector development policies that may be ongoing in the country. So value chain development, export investment promotion, etc. Last but not least, and that was uh, one of the topics of yesterday's first plenary session, policy evaluation is absolutely crucial. So you need better M&E frameworks because this is the only way to close the policy loop. And if you want, obviously, to upscale, to enable upscaling. So without that, it doesn't work. Very last point, and I apologize. Um, fact is that in, in, in most of the developing countries, a lot of, uh, a lot of cluster initiatives, a lot of driving to the poli cluster policies still do not driven. So a lot of the challenges that I've listed here uh, relate as much to the international donor community as much as they relate to, um, uh, to, to the beneficiaries or to the client countries. So I think one very important aspect is also that we as the development community take a step back and reevaluate some of our approaches from time to time and adjust. So on that positive note, I uh, apologize again. I was rushing very much through it, so if you did not get certain aspects of my presentation or you have further questions, please feel free to approach me. Thank you.